let's look at the title first. We're implementing the future, right? And we're talking about digital transformation in the SOAP for BT Guide. The reason the SOAP for BT Guide project was started was because we came out with a number of standards, really good standards, but the community really started using them from a technology perspective, but not from a business perspective. And things have changed from when we came out with a lot of our SOA standards, and they are today in a different scenario where there is transformation, digital transformation, digital change. I've got to thank Chris for having introduced me. I do many things. I run APTSI. I'm also a chief strategist for a $30-$40 billion organization too. So, or so a strategist, whatever you want to call me, to define my own term or define my own title role. <coughs> so, change is hard. And change is what is happening at a pace that organizations can handle very easily today. Change is happening in ways which, is, which are disrupting business models. It's not just that laid off people because they automated something. That isn't what is the kind of change that's happening. The change that is happening is because I stopped doing business the way I did business before. And that has huge implications. It has implications culturally. A lot of you are senior level leaders. You probably don't have to deal with things such as the scale agile framework, right? And agile delivery. Because we're sitting further up the ladder. And we're not having to go and look at how things are done. But the reality is different. The folks on the ground, they're using agile technologies. So structures now are becoming much more modular. Now how do you prevent that from becoming silos? Okay? So I kind of, you know, and, and I'm, I'm going through, there are a lot of slides, I'm going to start picking up some speed and we'll go to and fro. And to give you some context, I'll also be setting in a version of the deck with a lot of notes so you guys can always have a takeaway and follow up and there's my contact information on the deck too. But one of the things that's happening is this change is difficult because it's cultural. It impacts the business. I give people, I live in Boston, and there used to be a company called Wolverine Shoes. It's in there. They had, I think, 2,000 or 500 storefronts. Five years ago, they have no store friends that I know of anymore. They're all online. Now imagine a company that was there for a hundred years or something like that. Imagine the rate of change. Changing the way they do business, changing the way they do the numbers, changing the way they do the jobs. Now add to that agile delivery and you get structural issues. Right? You're creating new silos. How do you manage that? So these are some of the questions we'll talk about as we go through this example and as we go through this presentation. And I'll touch on that later on. But change is pervasive. Every one of these industries is going through radical change today. Everyone turns serious, right? But let's talk about the life sciences sector. Four years ago, I presented in the SCDM in Vegas. And people started laughing at me when they said, oh, we're going to be focused on big data, and analytics, and AI. Last year, there was not one like, big life sciences company did not commit itself to big data and AI. Every one of them. They were spending pretty much a significant, if not a large portion of their entire drug discovery, pharmacovigilance, <coughs> entire life cycle process on them. I could go through every one of these sectors, just give these as two examples. So, when you look at this figure over here, we're talking about the ecosystem which has changed. Some of you are old enough to think about Corba. Has anybody heard of Corba before? Oh, I was on the show. I'm not allowed. You and Chris are not allowed. Okay, well, you're not but okay. There, and I also know about Corba, so that dates me. Anyways, the fact is that that's when it started, to some extent. Actually, IBM had a standard for that, right? Congress? Uh, we had a product, and that's when I first went to IBM for the... But you uh, had the DCE spec, right? For data communication and, and RPC communication. Well, that's actually contributed to the open group now. DCE, open DCE... But I, this, I'm talking the one that was out there in like 1980s, early 90s. 
So DCE was the communications layer for um, COM and DCOM, which ended up being contributed so that we could do Corvo, which was component broker. Didn't work because it was all paper standard. Nobody, nobody implemented it. It became hard to implement because people were learning. Things changed, and I'm going to skip past one of my friends and colleagues, John Farmer, was one of the creators almost of the AI space. And I remember running the AI practices in the early 2000s, late 1990s. And it evolved into what we face today. I'm going to run across here for a second. Microservice architectures, API, IoT, all those things. Why, why is that important? Because we're now dealing with a very different structure of how things work. How do I do that? How do I map it into how I run my business? I know it sounds kind of different because as IT people, we don't care how the business runs, right? We should. Because rapidly, we are more and more getting integrated in the conversation. So let's, you know, who's, who's read the BFG? Oh, those who are British haven't, but most of those who are American have. I read it because my kids read it. But anyways, so, Roald Dahl was the author of the BFG. And he talked about, I mean, not he talked, I'm talking about it, just use that to make sure that we understand and use the right terms. So to establish some context, we talk about business services and things that corporations provide, that companies provide, even if you're a 10 person company. Capabilities are what you need to be able to do these things. And in a SOA world, in an API centric world, those APIs form the runtimes of those capabilities. Things that folks don't think about normally. They don't link in that last mile linkage. Business architects make to find capabilities. Technology people don't care. Well, in this world, they do them together as linkage. And that linkage is going to make a difference in which companies survive and, and, and are agile to address that rapid change we talked about. Business functions are the operational things that run and that keep things running when you're flying the plane. That engine, that's the business function. So business functions are the organizational structure and how things run. Business processes are how these business functions get executed. And the service oriented enterprise is measures things. So when we keep talking about K KPIs, has anybody heard about OKRs here? Okay, so if you study in the scale agile framework, you'll talk about OKRs. It's another way of measuring, I call them reach goals, the old days. You're measuring what you do, and now it's pervasive. But they're having a big struggle linking them to what the business does. Business functions are determined in terms of business. We hit that already. But remember, we are shifting to a new kind of enterprise, <coughs> service-oriented enterprise. So what's in it for me, and I'll go to this, hopefully you all have a reason to be here, but IT executives have a reason to start thinking, and this is something you need to communicate. I don't know how many of you deal with business executives. But I've sat on a board member's side in a large company. And when I talk to my CEO, he's a big guy, I guess much bigger than me. But anyway, but basically when I ask him questions or ask him questions, I looked at a scorecard. I didn't know that anybody knew what was doing in the delivery. I really didn't want to because I found out the hard way one day. And if I asked questions, those questions became things he had to work on and spend a lot of money. So I had to figure out a different way to ask questions is basically the answer. The second thing is IT executives and implementation. A lot of times now as we go through things, we don't know how to link them together, and this is a vehicle that we're establishing to link them together. What do enterprise architects get out of this? Enterprise architects have to be able to talk to different stakeholders, plan ahead. Somebody was talking in this morning's speaker, I think it was Dave about how you need to plan ahead. If you don't have a capability-based view of your company, you really are running around trying to address organizational structural change and tactical issues. Capabilities endure, they don't go away. Capabilities will remain there whether you're holding shoes, selling shoes at the storefront or on the web. Because those are things that you need to know. There's certain capabilities you require for the storefront. So we'll talk about those in a moment. So we'll talk about the, basically the SOA for BTC reference model, walk through a process to start realizing it, and go through an example. So this is the reference model that we've been creating. 
We call the left pillar the strategy or the strategic pillar. What does it do? It defines what the company is about. The mission, vision, goal. How many of you get involved in mission, vision, goal mapping? So when you do your mission, vision, goal mapping, you quantify it through some metrics, through some KPA, right? Something that's measurable. Then do you take that down and ask your, you know, business units to give you some map values to that? And do you create a Kaplan scorecard or something that goes up to the C level? Balance yeah, scorecard here. Yeah. Right, you create a balance scorecard here that's got some of the standard Kaplan metrics and then some of those which are unique to your business, right? Patient mortality and just talking healthcare, but it could be something else. Um, so that's important to understand that that initial step is handled and how that links the capabilities is also handled and describe and define those capabilities and kind of create a context model just like we create a technical reference model in Tokyo, business reference model, which tells you what are your capabilities. Why does that matter? Five years ago, you had siloed applications which supported those capabilities. Today, those capabilities are supported by sets of services. That's just rea the reality, not because so is cool, but because the cloud is cool. Because the lingua franca of the cloud is basically two things, streaming or services. So you really have not many options as you move forward. The second column talks about operational, the operational pillar. The operational pillar is about how to keep that plane flying while I'm making all my changes. And it really has some implications, we'll touch on them in a moment. But it's really about how I provide my business services to do the work and the organizational structure that supports it. The operating model is important because of two fundamental reasons. One is it allows you to figure out what to focus on. And secondly, it tells you how to run it, the governance part of it and the partnerance part of it. And it's important to understand how to focus. There's been so many scenarios that I've gone through in this last 20 years of doing this job in enterprise architecture roles where I've gone into companies, senior leadership, and they're trying to force a square peg into a round hole. And having a way to address that is critical for success, otherwise you're going to spend millions of dollars. So this is the figure with a little more detail. We've talked about business capabilities, we map them down to the technical capabilities, right? Those are the things, has anybody here heard about the SOAR reference architecture standard? Wow, that's a I think it's okay. So that's the standard that came out of the open group. It's based on capabilities that we define to support how people took technical decisions, really, in practical terms. It takes the service or the world, splits it into layers. Each layer has a set of capabilities and an architectural reference model. It's hugely useful because it also has a way to apply those within your particular context. The second, the operational pillar, when we look at it, you look at the left layer on here, it talks about business constraints, the SOAR reference architecture. Those two things, along with technology constraints, help you to determine solution architecture. It's a very simple rubric in a simple way to go about things. And that makes things faster and easier to do. The next thing you're looking at over there is, again, I'm flying this way. Have you ever heard about service catalogs or API catalogs? A lot of you have heard about API catalogs, right? How do you use your API catalog? But how do they use it? Is it curated? Do you address interoperability issues? Do you talk about categorization of the services? Do you address risks in terms of security? Do you have interoperability lineage? Do we think about that? Because not many people do that, so I'm asking these questions. Many companies are still wondering about these things. And the reason it's important is, just a little while ago I was in the GDPR meeting. And guess what? If I don't know where my data came from, I don't know what my liability is. Right? If I we live in a world where you sell things in a platform of the service, look at Amazon, look at even small hey, stores. How's it going? Pretty good, thank you. So these organizations that sell things in a platform of the service, you could expose your services out into the world. There's security controls, right? Authentication, authorization, the whole CIA, AAA track. The next thing, so having a service catalog well managed is 
critical for success, and not many people focus on that as much. Finally, we've talked a little bit about the operational operating model here. I just want to stop for a second on this slide because the slide is important. These quadrants came from an original work by Ross and Beale, adapted to service oriented architecture. So Ross and Beale are my kid. I don't know if I'm getting the names right. Ross and Beale, right? And I'm sure I'll, I live in the same area, so I'm probably going to run with the coffee shop. But the short answer is that these different models help you determine where you're going to focus your effort, your money, and your time. How many times have you struggled with the business? Are the technology teams over cultural and political battles trying to get things done because you were trying to make sure there was a common enterprise standard? Well, it didn't work, right? Many times. And this kind of helps you curate that. It helps you try to develop a focus, a, a filter, whichever way you want to call it. So we are coming out with a definition for what we call the SO for business maturity model. It's evolving. But we do have the dimensions and the functional areas defined. Andres is the author of the OSIN, sitting back there. That addressing to a larger extent still the technology side of things that we came out with the business vision in the beginning. And what you're going to use is you're going to use these two maturity models to kind of assess from a business context where you're focused, from a technology context where you're focused, and how you realize your roadmap. This is a process model. So keep in mind that over here, I'm going through a lot of slides with a lot of high level content, right? But this content is covered in a lot of detail in the guide. There's no way that I would cover 90 pages <coughs> in this presentation. But it covers these different aspects. You talk about business capabilities. We talk about driver alignment. We talk about the functional capability, uh, the curation of the runtime expression of those capabilities. We talk about ownership of those capabilities, right? Who owns them? Who does what? We talk about roadmap aspects for that, right? So when you look at the SOAF for business maturity model, there are certain things that we have identified over time. It's an evolving. Um, definition, we are still not flushed it out as a formal standard, and the open group will eventually take that up. And then we determine the business fit. We do basically capability mapping. I'm assuming a lot of you have done capability mapping in your organization so far. Because that's not a new concept, it's been there for about a decade and a half. And then you tailor those capability models. How many, what's your experience with capabilities? I like all the audience. Very little. Very little? We're just getting started. You're just getting started. Andres? Capabilities have been along, around for a long time with <coughs> CMM. But what's your experience in using it from a business context? You know, this is one of those things that, uh, you know, uh, it is very difficult to quantify. I think the exercise of trying to understand capabilities and, and actually realizing a capability is, you know, the execution is, is really where... Hard. Hard, yeah. It's hard. And largely because it involves people, right? Mm -hmm. And hard to quantify. So think about now different capabilities. What I under talked about, how do you quantify them? Well, technically and business-wise, because that's a point of alignment, right? And in the case of services, it now becomes more tangible, easier to quantify. That's why we talked about services and the run times of those, right? The other part about it is capabilities in the context of durable capabilities of how the business is run and enabled. My experience is capabilities don't change very often. Structures change every three months. And a lot, a lot of EA organizations run after the structural aspects. This group is doing that well. This group will be full bar group next week. Doesn't matter. Technical capabilities, the reason we came out with the SORA, we spent a long time across the entire <coughs> industry looking at it. And if you look in practice, the cloud is not very different. It's just an expression of it in a different way. In fact, there's a slide in the supporting materials which shows that to some extent. 
you determine your technical roadmap, and you remember this is kind of a waterfall in the picture, but this, these steps can be very often working concurrently. You're defining a, your business roadmap and your technical roadmap, and you're kind of working in tandem on both of them. And then you have a phased execution based on capabilities with a particular governance structure, a process governance structure, helping you determine where and when you want to rebalance. In the case of things such as SAFE, you'll be like, okay, I have a lean portfolio, and I have my capability model and my technical cap capability roadmap, and I balance my services against the lean portfolio. Uh, there is a the SOA Vitality Guide. So a governance framework out of the open group. There's a figure there which talks to that. It doesn't express it in these terms, but that figure is one I've used a lot. So. So this is a quick snapshot of the different aspects of the functional areas and the dimensions of the, I mean, these are the maturity levels and these are the dimensions, right? There's a figure with all the details, but if I put that in here, it's a bit really granular and you won't be able to see it. So there's a slide at the end of the deck which provides the details. When you're talking about mission, vision, metrics, capability, mapping, where are you in this journey? You've just started, right? So you're probably somewhere here. And we'll talk, when we go with the example, we'll talk about that. Once you're done with that, your OSIM has given you a technological <coughs> view. Where am I in the company? And, and, and there, I have a figure of the OSIM also at the back. Just put it right here. You map that to the SOAR reference architecture. And you use this meta model over there to help determine what your commitments are. You look at what products do I have in the API world, it's do I use Salesforce or CRM? Or do I use Sugar CRM? Or what am I doing in the context of Office platforms? Do you use OpenOffice? Do I use you know, Azure for certain things? Do I use AWS? How do I deal with interoperability? What's my infrastructure service capability? What's my platform and service capability? And you come out with a roadmap of different stages defining how you get to be that service-oriented enterprise. What that does tell you, if you look at our definition of service-oriented oh, service enterprises, for your services and your capabilities, start defining metrics. They are going to evolve, and as you do things, you're going to update this definition. So let's start looking at a real example. Uh, I wouldn't say real, I'm going to qualify that otherwise I'll get in trouble, but it's not real. It's really a hypothetical. It's Acme Healthcare Company as an example. So this, you know, around the time that the ACA, the Walmart Care Company, I was pulled in or the organization to work with the, the assessment and guidance and strategy for three of the largest insurance companies, healthcare partner companies in the country. Their idea, so they do insurance and they do uh, hospital system, provider, care, etc. You start looking at your business strategies, <coughs> right? Nobody wants the patient to die. Patient mortality has been a, me a metric in the top line scorecard or in your top scorecard for decades, at least two decades. Yeah. But you no longer think because the science has changed, and this is true of many things that have been evolving the last decade and a half. You no longer think in terms of wellness, but in terms of symptoms. You no longer think in terms of symptoms, but you think in terms of wellness. Change the business model, changes your financial model. There are a number of different criteria that you start addressing. And as you go through those criteria, you start taking decisions on what that future is going to start looking like, right? These are technical decisions, but you're going to also come out with business decisions. If you look at what the person is going to look like for Acme Healthcare Company, anybody from the healthcare sector in this room? No. Then maybe I should have used a different example, but anyway, then we'll continue with the healthcare sector example. If I were to go to any company like a Blue Cross or an Aetna or a Cigna, every system they built for 50 years was all built around the plan and the employer. Because the person who paid for the bills was the plan and the employer. And you had a member of 
They didn't know how to kill two marbles. They knew that had number XYZ. That is all they cared about. Since the late 90s, and definitely now, employers can't pay those bills anymore. Obamacare started shifting that even more to the individual. And that's not because of legal reasons and ideological reasons. It's because of practical, fiscal reasons. Employers could afford those bills. Ford nearly went bankrupt largely because of healthcare bills to retired <coughs> employees. I worked with Jim and the GM and GMAC and I know how it was, it's, it's common knowledge. It was out there in the apartment boards. How big are the, the debt load was. So the science has changed. We're dealing with omics, proteomics, but I don't want to go over that, but basically a lot of the healthcare space, the life sciences numbers, and the way we do things has changed. When we look at all of that, how do you link that in to a company which never knew what the person was? I could take the same figure, by the way, and replace that with financial planning. I've been called into at least three large mutual funds to take a look at things to do the same thing. Right? Same problem. We don't know about the person. We had a retirement plan. Same thing applies to the pair. All of these, now, all of these different participants in this ecosystem, all of them have to interoperate and interact and think about a person. We just talked about this guy here who was a pair, right? And so what you have today, when ASME starts a journey, is a number of siloed groups based and focused on organizational units. And basically based on who pays the bill. So I have a group which deals with GE, with GM, with Ford, with Boeing, so on and so forth. I don't know about the individual who can now shift and move to different plants. Now I'm in trouble. I have to sell to the individual versus the company. Data is not alike, not available, etc. So now I have to start thinking about what business capabilities do I need, what drivers do I need, what metrics do I need. So if you look at the strategy pillar, what is our scorecard today? What are the KPIs and metrics we measure? What are the mission, vision, goal? They're no longer in sync with the reality of today. And we have no roadmap, no capability based model. A lot of companies don't have operational capability-based models and are learning the journey. What do the operational pillar say? Again, silos. I measure the salary and the payments to my senior executives based on how they sell. Anybody from an insurance company here? Oh boy, that's amazing. That's the first time no financial services are out there. That's first with the open group. Anyway. But if you were from an insurance company, almost any one of you would be saying, oh, we kind of measured it by having large corporate clients as one group, SMB as another group, so on and so forth. And each of those groups would then be siloed into client X, client Y, client Z, right? That has to change, and I have to pay my C levels differently. Think about that. Think about the organizational disruption you just caused. What's the operating model? It's diversified because I'll give an example of a large, I don't know if you want to call it utility, but an embedded systems company that I have to work with that was set up there in the project architecture. And there were 11 subsidiaries all competing against each other to be paid. So what justification and reason and rationale was there for them to share anything? So you had to look at it. If I had gone and told them, share your services, and they would have just told me, sorry, you have no idea what you're doing. So to be able to address and cover that gap, you have to look at that operating model, that filter, and say, where should I focus? Where should my information architecture investment be? I have 32, that's what I have, 32 different service systems across the company. We reduced it to three, which is a lot less than 32. That was easy for them to align on because they were saving money and everybody looked good. So as part of what we've done with the SOA for BT is we've actually created a model, a taxonomy for drivers. There's a lot more detail with each of these boxes. Where does this help? As you look at your drivers, you can start quantifying and impact and start linking them because we also have a model which links them to the KPIs 
and the kinds of dead data that you want to capture. So here's a standard taxonomy. Anybody who's a lot of MBAs over here? No. Five force model, order. Five force model, right? This is our order guidance. With some other stuff which is IP like specific, regulatory, right? But those are the things, it's kind of funny when I talk to company after company after company, they go, I would remember the school grads and people out of Northwestern and and they don't think that when we're applying this, it doesn't apply only to that top business strategy level. It has to filter through. Because in today's world, if you don't swivel and you can't pivot and start going to say, you can't compete with Salesforce to create a CRM platform. When you have a legacy platform, you need to be able to pivot fast. And how do you pivot fast? You have to pivot through those APIs. And does the guy sitting in the room understand that? He needs to. We've talked about scorecards, but in this case, I talked about starting heat just because these are how we started measuring hospitals and doctors. Because before we paid a doctor based on the procedure, you went in, you had a cold, you made a doctor's visit, you paid him $100, and then you did five procedures, and you paid him $1,000. Now, he doesn't get paid by the insurance company until your blood pressure drops to a certain level. If not, the amount of money he's paid is, is cut. That's why a lot of physicians started quitting their jobs, actually, in America. And that's a fundamental change in the way they do business. A lot of hospitals also went bankrupt because of that. Um, so being able to start getting ready, the hospital and the IDNs that have survived, the physicians that are surviving, are making that leap, that adaptation. So let's start doing some capability mapping. We need we need a pretty UI because you don't want folks to go to sleep, right? Working on the stuff. You need to be able to be secure to do business. That should be common capability. All of you must be having that, right? Secure to do business. More than there must be, yeah, sure, I like it, right? You need to be able to have channel independence. So, uh, David, so have, do you end up dealing with channel independence? I don't know what your role is, so maybe that's not a yes. question. Software, so we have to the channel. Right, and you have to deal with, make sure that you're not locked into a particular vendor and you're able to shift to pivot, right? Uh, or, you know, you have runtime situations and they can meet the demand. Or you have a vendor that does not evolve to new technologies and you don't want to be left nowhere. So these are examples of different capabilities and you need to start figuring out in your roadmap when are they going to happen, what are the metrics you're going to capture. All that data starts needing to get captured. When you do that, and I always tell people it becomes easy. Because when you do that and you have a few spreadsheets or, or tools, whichever tool you like, now you can map it into whatever tool you use for, and I'm going to date myself again, Nico <laughs> anyway, for project planning, whatever tool you use. MS project, whatever, you now have an ability to know where you are. <coughs> we talk about DevOps. I, don't, I did not put in a whole process governance framework model here because that would have been much longer. But you need to be able to think of strategy, portfolio management, and think about the context of where your troops on the ground are. Any of you guys from the military? At least you have more honest. So you, you have the concept of platoon, you have the concept of a regiment, and the concept of division, right? A platoon, independent unit, can operate on its own, right? A regiment has an iron wall, quartermaster, so on and so forth, operate on its own. They have logistics and, and health. A division has some more specializations. Did you build an F-35 uniquely for a regiment or a platoon? You could never afford it, right? So think about it. The military was efficient anyway, and it would, let's jump out past that. But they were. But if you look at your IT teams, they're like, well, we want to do whatever our team feels is the right thing. Right? And that's, a, that's okay. But you need to start factoring that 
dynamic and how do you manage that dynamic? You manage that dynamic through goals, principles, and policies, which you then quantify and link to your measure of success of the employees. <coughs> HR report. Now they have incentives. Their leaders have incentives. So that's one aspect of that operating model here that we talked about. The operational, as we start evolving things, you start defining what your new world is going to look like and what those business functions are going to look like, what those APIs are going to look like. And you start building out your service plan, which you're going to map to your lean portfolio on that model. Now you are empowered to move faster. I'm going to have to Chris. You have no five minutes. Okay, so I'll wrap it up in two. We've talked a bit about these, so I'm going to skip this and, and this, and I'm going to go. This is where you work, right? And we've assigned some maturity levels in the SOAP business maturity model. So, sorry, the business maturity model. And if you look at it, that's against each dimension, right? We started determining certain key things. And you'll see that a lot of them exist. And you're going to reach to some levels where you have service. This is, of course, the idea. Most companies will stop at stop at Alliance Services. They won't get there to the service or enterprise. Not fast. Not most companies, which are not trivially sized. If you have five people in the company, different competition. And we'll get back to changes hard. You know, we've talked about Sears. Yeah, I was out of Detroit. So Kmart. You know, they didn't get home. Right? We talked about and Chicago. I'll say it was Sears out of Chicago. And We've talked about how it is sudden and disruptive. Anybody from the manufacturing sector? <laughs> Anybody heard about Industry 4.0 and in digital manufacturing? How much? Well, I can't ask you how much you're spending, but anyways, I can guarantee that you're spending a lot. I was originally from Detroit, right? So I still have my feet out in Detroit. I know. I don't think there's a single OEM, a single tier one provider, a single provider in any fashion who's not considering digital manufacturing transformational change in their company. Not one. And they're spending 500, 600 million, a billion, and more. <coughs> that adds up. In my notes, you'll see, I talk about it as being trillions of dollars. That's the level of impact that we face today. So I've given a kind of the, of the reference model and the journey. What I'd like to do is have a quick set of questions and answers and reach out. Feel free to ask for more detail. We will also have more detail as we roll out the guide, which we hope to have out by Colorado, which is in July. But I'd love to have the dialogue right now. We talk about digital transformation and digital evolution. By the way, we talk about digital evolution. We talk about digital transformation, but if you look at today's world, you're dealing with it all the time. The change is not stopping. It doesn't, you don't transform and stop. You're always, it's like continuous improvement. Something you're going to be facing all the time. With that, I'll lay the questions out to the floor. Any questions?